Well, good morning, church. Well, my name is Adam, and I'm the youth and young adult pastor here at First Baptist Surfside, and we're so glad that you decided to worship with us this morning. Um, If you happen to be a guest with us this morning, we would love it if you would fill out one of the Connect cards. There should be one in the seat back in front of you, and you can drop that off in the offering plate when it comes by. Um, We'd love just to have a record of your visit and see if we can answer any questions that you might have about our church and see if we can minister to you in some way. Uh, A few announcements this morning. Uh, First, our Discover class uh, for new members who have not yet gone through the class or those interested in membership here at our church. Uh, That class is today, uh, so it's going to be in the fellowship hall right after this service. If you uh, did not register, we do have a few extra lunches for you if you'd like to just show on up. Um, If not, we'll have it again in in a couple months. Secondly, in April, we have an uh, event coming up for our student ministry called a D-NOW, short for Disciple Now. It's going to be April 28th and 29th. That's a Friday night and all day Saturday. So it's an event where we're going to invite some other churches, some other youth groups to come and participate with us. We'll have a guest speaker, and we'll do some service projects and do a different, uh, some fun things, maybe have some inflatables and things like that. Uh, but the theme of that weekend is going to be revealed. And the, the theme verse is John 1.14, how the Word became flesh, and we um, beheld His glory. And it's the idea that all of Scripture points to the cross of Jesus. And so that's going to be the theme for the weekend. And we're praying that many students will give their life to Jesus that weekend, and many others will be strengthened in their understanding of Scripture. And so I'm going to have more information to come about that, uh, and you'll likely see me showing up to your small group uh, in the coming Sunday mornings, and I'm going to share different ways that you can help me uh, and serve that weekend. So this morning I'm going to read from 1 Peter 3, verses 13 to 18. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil." For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God and being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Would you pray with me? So Father, we bow before you this morning and we want to humble ourselves before you as we worship you. And Lord, we recognize that it is better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil in Christ. Never did evil, yet he suffered much. He suffered for our sin. He was the righteous one that suffered for us, the unrighteous, so that we might be reconciled to the Lord. And so, God, we give you all the glory and honor for that. And we pray that we would show ourselves approved and study and be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks us for the reason for the hope that we have in the gospel. And so I pray that you would be glorified and honored this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Y'all would stand with us as we get into our time of singing and worship to the Lord this morning. Sing this with me. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet. On each face, 
people said? Amen. Amen. Today we are going to continue to pray for unreached people groups as we are doing through the year 2023. But before we do that, we're going to take a moment and highlight one of our special ministries here at First Baptist Surfside that has just been doing just that for decades. That is our WMU ministry. That is a ministry that meets here on the second Saturday of every month. It's a group of ladies And we've been praying for missions here on Sunday morning, but they do that every single time that they meet. Now, WMU might be something that's familiar to you, maybe it's unfamiliar to you, um, but it is a ministry that has been around now for well over 100 years. And the purpose of WMU is multiple things, but it's focused on missions. Again, it's a group of ladies that gather for fellowship, to study the Word of God, but to learn about missions, pray for missions, encourage the church to pray for missions, and then also participate 
and missions as well. And so before I go into more detail about our WMU, here's a video that shows a little bit more about WMU as a whole. Guys, if you'd play that video. I'm sometimes asked, what do you envision for the future of WMU? The landscape transitions moment by moment. I often feel unsettled by the terrain that shifts constantly beneath our feet. In spite of the changes swirling around us at a dizzying pace, we can be confident about the future God has for us. How? By understanding our mission matters most. Our unwavering focus is to make disciples of Jesus who live on mission. When we live with a singular conviction, clarity emerges even in the midst of chaos. National WMU has a kingdom impact in every state and 39 countries. Our desire is that peoples of the earth would have the opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel. Visit WMU.com to learn how you can be involved in the ministry of WMU. And as I mentioned, we have a group of WMU ladies that meet on the second Saturday of every month. If you're not a part of that, we would love to invite you to come and be a part of that. And again, what are they doing? They're praying for missions. They're encouraging us to pray and to give to missions. So things like our Annie Armstrong Easter offering, which is just around the corner, we give. And 100% of the proceeds that go to that offering go to support North American missionaries. In fact, about 4,000. And then our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Again, every penny that is given to that goes to directly help international missionaries. Again, more than 4,000 of those. But our WMU group also gathers together to do things like prayer walking, prisoner packets, baskets for teachers, that and so much more. So again, if you're not a part of that, we would invite you to come. And we also just want to take a moment and recognize our WMU director. I think she's up here behind me. Miss Martha, if you would stand and let's give her a round of applause. So, we love you, Miss Martha. We thank you for all that you do. And so based on their example, let's take time to focus and pray for unreached people groups. That is a group of people that our International Mission Board defines as less than 2% Christian. And what you see is it'll be on the screen, but something new this week is that in the lobby on your way out, we have provided cards that have the information on the screen. If you want to take this and then spend the rest of the week in prayer for this people group. But you see there on the screen that we are praying for the Saeed people around 6.5 million of them across five different countries, but primarily found in Pakistan. They do have the entire Bible in their language, the Sindhi language. But notice that bottom line. Percent Christ followers, zero. We haven't seen a zero yet. We've seen low numbers, but we haven't had a zero. Now, I don't know about you, but that should break our hearts. See, we come to church and we get upset about a lot of different things, don't we, at times? We get upset over something someone said or the temperature or the color of the carpet or something that didn't go along to what we wanted it to be like, but that. 6.5 million people and not one of them know Jesus. That should upset us. That should motivate us. And just for a moment, what I want you to do is just look at the picture of the man that's there. I don't know who he is. I don't know his name or anything about him. But I do know one thing. He is made in the image of God. He is someone that is an image bearer, meaning that he is a human just like we are, with faults and flaws, but someone that I imagine loves his family, loves his wife and his kids, seeks to provide for them, has hopes and dreams, and I also know it is someone that Jesus died for. And so as we gather and pray for the Saeed people, we can pray that God would work amongst them because what we have learned is that they are a very powerful people. In fact, most of them are priests or teachers or hold positions of government to which the Joshua Project, where we get a lot of this information comes from, says, quote, because of their sheer religious and political weight, if someone from this people group gave their life to Christ, they could have as much influence as the po Apostle Paul himself. So as we gather and pray, we want to pray that God would move amongst them and then also that he would cultivate within us a heart to take the gospel to those that need it. And so as our ushers come down, let's pray for the Saeed people. 
and pray for our offerings as well today. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you that you have made us in your image. Lord, you have made us to be like you in the fact that we love, that we care, that we can have relationships with others. But Lord, through sin, we have impacted that image. Lord, we have marred that image. That image has been broken. And so God, I thank you that while we were yet sinners, you sent Jesus to pursue us, to love us, to die for us, to make us new. That includes us here in this room, but that includes the Saeed people. Lord, that you love them, that you died for them, and you desire that they would come to repentance and faith. God, today we would pray that you would move amongst them. Lord, we would pray for even one today, that through your Spirit, Lord, you would draw them to you. Lord, that you would save them, that you would make them into an Apostle Paul in the fact that they would stand boldly for you amongst a very difficult place. God, we would pray for a spiritual awakening to happen even amongst the Saeed people, one that would be so great we would know that it would only be from you. But God, I pray that as we consider the needs around us, it wouldn't be something that just crosses our mind and then we leave and go about our day. But Lord, we would be motivated. We would be motivated to pray. We would be motivated to go and to give. Lord, I thank you for these that give so faithfully in our church every Sunday. I pray that you would bless them for their faithfulness and God, I pray that you would use these offerings that are given to, Lord, support things like the International Mission Board, the things like the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, as missionaries have been sent to reach the Saeed people. God, I pray that you would work amongst us and use us to be good stewards of what is given, that we might be a light in the darkness. Jesus, we love you and we thank you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.
of that we have a joy we have peace and we have um, a hope and a peace about today and about the, all the, the troubles in this world just kind of pass away and fade away Lord I was reminded of this week Lord as I was seeing all the craziness that's happening in our world and in the news and everything reminded me that I needed to cast my eyes to Calvary where Jesus died and bled for me. So Lord, you are the reason that we can sing. Because he lives I can face tomorrow because he Amen. As our choir makes its way down, we're also going to dismiss our kids for children's church through the third grade that could meet there in the lobby and be taken to a time a little bit more age appropriate for them. But for us, let's take our Bibles. I hope you have one with you this morning and let's turn over to 1 Timothy as we continue this journey through the book of 1 Timothy. 1 
Timothy chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 7. And so today, uh, Mr. Jim Hake is going to come and read our passage for us. Jim. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to the teachers of the law to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jim. The story goes of a man who lived in an old home that sat on several acres of land. And it was said that in his backyard, there was lots of open land, but there in the middle that kind of stood over the entire property was an old oak tree. It had stood there for decades, majestically towering over everything else that was around it. People loved the oak tree. His kids played in it as they grew older and that he spent much time there under that tree. But it was said that one night as he went to bed, a terrible storm blew up. He said that the wind and the, the, wave, the, the, wind and the rain blew against the house. And he said all throughout the night there was lightning and there was thunder. But there was one thing in the middle of the night. There was a loud crash that shook the house. The foundation of the house shook and it woke him up, but when he went to the window to kind of peer outside to see what was taking place, he couldn't because of it was so dark. So the very next morning, he got up and he went outside and saw that oak tree that once stood so strong had been blown over. At first he thought, well, maybe the wind just got that strong and it toppled over, but when he went to investigate this tree, he found something different. He said as he went toward the tree, from a crack that was there in the tree as a result of it falling, was pouring out hundreds if not thousands of termites. That these termites had infiltrated this tree probably over the course of many years, starting small, but they began to multiply, they began to grow, they began to eat at the integrity of that tree to the point that when the wind came, it could no longer stand and it fell. Now today, we are continuing in the book of 1 Timothy. Remember, Paul is writing to Timothy, who is a younger pastor of the church at Ephesus. And remember, through this, Paul is defining what does it mean to be a pastor and what is the standard that which you as the church get to hold me to. But on the flip side, he is also defining for us what is the local church and what is the standard by which you and I are able to strive for. Because let's be honest. There are countless opinions about what a church is and what a church should be. And what Paul reminds us is that it isn't up for us to get to decide what that is. It's not up for me and you to decide what our mission is as the church of First Baptist Surfside. No, it is simply up to us to submit to what God has already told us in His Word. The key verse of 1 Timothy, we're going to come back to this often, is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. You'll see it on the screen. Paul says, this is the reason why I'm writing. This is the entire theme of this letter to Timothy. He says, so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is, he says, the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of the truth. So Paul says first, notice what the definition of a church is as a pillar of the truth. That is the idea of truth crumbles in our society all around us. The church is meant to stand firm as a pillar of the truth. Now, what we are recognizing and what we thought about a lot last week is that this idea of absolute truth to our society is closed-minded, it is bigoted, it is hateful, and to some, it would even be classified as evil. What we have to be reminded of is that this idea of truth should not cause us to puff out our chest as though we are now superior, that we are now better than anyone else because we've seen how much damage that has caused in our church and in the culture. No, this idea of truth should humble us. 
God, who are we? God, why would you have entrusted this truth with us? Because we are reminded that as a church, we are to stand on the truth, but to do so in love. Why? Because the most loving thing that we can do for someone is to share the truth with them. Why? Because it is the truth, Jesus says, that will set them free. But there's a second key in that verse that I don't want us to skip over because I think it's important. We are stewards of the truth, but Paul says there are certain things that will hinder our stewardship. He says, notice, that we are to know how to behave in the household of God. And remember, Paul's not talking about children behaving. He's talking about adults who need to be reminded how to behave in the church. Why? Because they're acting like children in the life of the church. We are stewards of the gospel. And what Paul shows us is that we are not structured in the right way, if people are behaving in ungodly ways, if there is division amongst the church, then that stewardship, that proclamation of the gospel is then hindered in the life of the church. But what Paul shows us to me is sobering. Because he reminds us that the greatest attack to the church is not outside the church. It's inside the church. That false teachers would come and twist the truth. And like those termites, they would start small. Maybe even innocent at first. But if left unchecked, these false teachers would begin to gnaw at the integrity of the truth of the church to the point that the church would fall. That this pillar, this pillar of truth that is the church would start to crumble. But what Paul does, and I think it's surprising, but I think it's important, is that he reminds us that the very motivation for us fighting and standing for truth is not just the truth itself. It's love. Love is our motivation. Love is our goal. And so the two things that I see in this text this morning that are important is number one, he calls us to have a love for the truth, but then also love others with the truth. So let's look at number one together. We are to have a love for the truth. Paul says, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Remember, Ephesus was a key city at the time. It was a hub of the culture and of the trade. It had a lot of influence. And so Paul knew that if Ephesus could be reached for Jesus, the entire world would be influenced by Jesus. And so Paul comes and sets in order the church at Ephesus because he knows how important it is. Then he leaves to Ephesus and allows Timothy to stay behind to entrust and guard what was set in order. But what I find fascinating is that just a short time after Paul leaves, he calls a meeting with the pastors or the elders of the church at Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20, you're going to see it on the screen because I think it's that important that we look at it. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 30. Again, Paul calls the elders of the church at Ephesus together, and he says to them, pay careful attention to yourself and to all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in and attack you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things. Through the Word of God, Paul saw the church of Ephesus being built up into a pillar of the truth. But Paul also knew how quickly that could change because he says that even among these elders of the church at Ephesus, those men that were meant to oversee and pastor the church, wolves would come. Now, my question is, is how long did that take? Paul says wolves are coming, but here in 1 Timothy 1, he says the wolves have come. How long did that take? Just five years. Five years from the warning to the reality It only took five years from the church of Ephesus to be a pillar of the truth to now being infiltrated with wolves, twisting the Word of God and devouring the flock. You see, I'm reminded, church, that of all the things that we have built here 
at First Baptist Surfside. I am proud of the church that we are and the church that we are becoming. But I am also reminded that as we build into a pillar of truth, there is somebody that hates what we are doing. And that is Satan himself. And as a result, he is seeking in any way possible to hinder our stewardship of the gospel. If you've ever done any type of renovation work, you know that it is much easier to tear something down than it is to build something up. That's why as a church, we have to be on guard and continue every single day to fight and guard what God has entrusted with us. That's why Paul, he says, leaves Timothy in Ephesus. Why? That he might be on guard for the truth. He says, I left you in verse 3 so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and genealogies which promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Paul says that we are the stewards of the gospel. But now there were some in the church that were distracting away from the mission of the church. The question is, is what are these false doctrines, these false teachings that we have to be on guard against? I think Paul gives us two categories here in this text. Number one, he says we have to avoid any different doctrine. Now we have to be careful here because a lot of people would take that idea and use it as a weapon in order to get their own agenda across. So what is this doctrine? What is this truth that we have to be careful of? I think it's important and helpful to me in order to think about different orders of doctrine. You'll see on the screen what I mean. To me, this is helpful for us as we consider what do we guard and, and what is there room to have liberty in. So when they're talking about orders of doctrine, number one, that first order of doctrine, what is that? That would be something about who is God? Who is Jesus? How is somebody saved? Those essential truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ that would differentiate someone being saved and not saved. Second order of doctrine or issues would be things that are about doctrine, but maybe things that aren't about salvation. So the exact order of end times, God's sovereignty and salvation, these would be doctrinal issues that brothers and sisters in Christ may disagree with, but at the same time still go to heaven and worship God together. Now these are important things, don't get me wrong, but we may have disagreements on those Third order issues are things that are about the church as far as style of music, attire in the church, order of the service, things like that that really have no basis in the Word of God but ultimately come down to preference. It's okay that you have your preference and brothers and sisters in Christ even in this room are going to disagree and see different eye to eye the things on third order issues. So what is Paul referring to? I think primarily he is referring to those first order issues. We can agree to disagree on most second and third level issues, but on those first order issues, who is God? How is someone saved? Who is Jesus? Those are things that we cannot and will not compromise. Those are the things that will allow us to be the pillar of truth. Now, I know as I say that, Many in our culture would hear those words and accuse me, accuse us of being unloving. How can you say that there is only one truth? How can you say that you have the truth? Aren't there many different religions and others that are having the truth and coming to God in different ways? How can you be sure that only you have the truth? What I find interesting is that the Christians of the first century, they were actually facing the exact same thing. You see, Christians in the first century, did you know, were actually labeled as atheists? Christians in the first century were called atheists. You say, pastor, how is that? Well, because in that time, it was a plurality of gods. Everyone worshiped different gods. You had your gods, I had my gods, we would worship them, and we could get along as a result of it. But Christians came, said, no, there is one true God. You see, now in our culture today, we don't believe in a plurality of gods, so to speak. We're not worshiping different idols in our culture, but we have the same issue. Why? Because people believe there are multiple ways to God. 
It's still a plurality of gods as far as people finding different ways to come to God. Many people would think about it in this way. There's a parable. It's called a parable of the blind men and the elephant. Some of you maybe have heard this before, but it represents kind of our culture's thinking when it comes to plurality and truth. So the parable of the the elephant and the blind man goes like this. There's an elephant sitting out in a field. And three or four blind men come into the field and know that there's something there. And so they begin to try to grasp and feel at the elephant in different ways, and they come to different conclusions. So one blind man comes up to the elephant and he rubs the the trunk of the elephant and he says, well, that's a snake. Another one comes up and rubs the, the leg of the elephant and says, well, that's a tree, that's not a snake. The other one rubs the side of the elephant and says, well, that's a wall. And what the idea is, is what our culture would say, is that they're all kind of getting to the same thing, but they have different perspectives on what the truth is. And that's kind of us with God. We're all kind of blindly feeling our way for life, and, and we th- see different parts of God, and we interpret it differently. There's only one major flaw with that. You see, there's the elephant and the blind men, but there's a third character in that parable that doesn't get talked about. Who is that? It's the observer. Because there's somebody that's observing all of this and knows that that's not a tree, that's not a wall, that's not a snake, that's an elephant. And it doesn't matter what their interpretation is, at the end of the day, it's an elephant. In the same way, even though we might have our ideas of what truth is, there is someone who sees all and has made all, and he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that we were lost, we were dead in our trespasses and sin, we were enemies and rebels against God himself, but God loved us and pursued us, and that he sent his son Jesus into this world that he might pursue us in our sin, die for our sin, so that the wrath of God that, was poured, that we deserve to have poured out on us was poured out on him so that he would stand in our place, so that through repentance and faith, our case could be legally dismissed. That we could be made right before a just and a holy God if today, through faith in Christ alone, we would trust in Him. So you see, if the gospel is the truth that leads us to everlasting life, to peace and to joy, and we then compromise that truth, I would submit to you that's not love at all. No, the greatest act of love would be to share with them the truth, the cure, for the malady of sin in their life. That's why Galatians 1.9, Paul says bluntly, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel that is contrary to the one that you have received, let that man be accursed. Different doctrine. But there's a second category here that I think is important for us to consider as well. It's this idea, he says, of myths in genealogy. So you'll see it on the next screen. So we're not talking about a different doctrine, but the category I would describe it as simply that which is unhelpful. Now we don't really know a lot about these myths and genealogies. Most believe these were Jewish writings at the time that probably weren't inherently wrong, but they weren't helpful. There were books at the time that would kind of be rewrites of the Old Testament and and the genealogies and the stories to try to give a little bit more excitement, more flavor, more insight into what was happening in the Old Testament. And it doesn't appear Paul says that they were wrong, but they were unhelpful. They weren't harmful, but they weren't helpful. Yet they caused just as much damage as these teachings against the gospel. Why? Because they promoted speculation rather than stewardship. They distracted the church away from the gospel itself. And because the church was distracted, then the gospel itself did not go forth. So for us, myths and genealogies, that's not something we really think about a lot in our church. But the question is, is what are some of these examples? What are things that we have to be on guard about? What are things that we have to be careful of? Because maybe they're not harmful, but they're not helpful. Let me give you two categories. You'll see them on the next screen. What's unhelpful? Number one, I would warn us to be on guard against what I would call a fascination of revelation that comes from outside the Bible. What does that mean? 
Think of dreams, visions, someone who claims that they had some out-of-body experience and they went to heaven or they went to hell and saw what was taking place there. And we know there's countless accounts of that, countless books and stories that have been written about that very thing. Now, the question that we have to ask is, do I think that God can use a dream or a vision? Well, yeah, he's God. He can use whatever he deems necessary. And in fact, we hear of Muslims in the Middle East that have dreams of Jesus and as a result are giving their life to Christ in mass. However, when we talk about dreams and visions and out-of-body experiences, I have a few concerns. Number one is, how do you know that that dream or that vision was actually from God or that it was just a dream? I've had a lot of dreams. I've had dreams where people were chasing me in my house only to wake up and find out what? There was no one in my house. It was just a dream. So how do I know that this experience that I'm saying that I've had is really from God or just a dream? Secondly, the question is, is that this dream or this vision or this experience, is it in alignment with God's Word? You see, the Bible is God's special revelation to us about Himself. And we know that God cannot and will not contradict Himself. Therefore, if someone comes and says, I had an experience where I went to heaven or I saw Jesus or something of that nature, we then can take that experience and compare it to the Word of God. And if it does not align with the Word of God, then we can say, based on the Word of God, that that experience was false. But third, my third concern is this, that in most of these cases, what is the result of the accounts? distraction. Now, I don't believe most that are sharing these are doing this maliciously or to cause problems within the body of Christ, but the question is this, as someone is sharing these accounts of going to heaven or all of these things, what's happening in the church? Distraction. Why? Because the church spends hours and hours and hours studying this account or questioning these accounts, and for every hour spent on the account, what are they not spending time on? The gospel of Jesus Christ causing us to be hindered in our stewardship of the gospel. Second category is similar, but it's also dangerous in my opinion. It is that we have to be careful of an unhealthy obsession with the end times. Now, let me be clear. Do I believe that Jesus is coming again and He is coming literally, physically, and bodily? Yes, absolutely. I want that to be clear. But at the same time, do I believe firmly that Jesus is definitely going to come back within the very near future? My answer, I have absolutely no idea. If God wanted us to know when He was coming back, He would have told us when He was coming back. And I believe there's many reasons God did not tell us, but I think part of it is that if He told us when, we would spend our time distracted over things that we were not meant to worry about instead of focusing on our mission. Instead, what do we find? We find the nonstop obsession with things like who is the Antichrist? And we see hundreds, if not thousands, of speculation. Well, that person's the Antichrist, or that person's going to be the Antichrist. Hundreds of different speculations, but each time, what do we find? That speculation was wrong. Or, secondly, trying to unearth some deeper meaning found in the Bible. The biblical code, so to speak, where someone will take the Hebrew alphabet and try to find deeper meaning that we find is simply not there. Or third, constantly looking for end-time prophecies fulfillment. When did we see this so much? Well, we saw it back in 2020, didn't we? When hundreds of pastors and evangelists and prophets said that 2020, that was the year Jesus was going to come back. That they knew Jesus was coming back that year. Well, that was 2020. What year are we in now? 2023. And as a result, I believe and I would actually submit that each one of those pastors should either ask for an apology or they should resign tomorrow. Why? Because they were proven to be false prophets. You might say, well, pastor, what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. Each time that that supposed prophecy was wrong, the credibility of the gospel was hindered and the church spent countless hours distracted from the Great Commission. 
countless videos of prophecies and end times, and you watch them, and what do you realize? Most of them have absolutely no biblical foundation. It's all speculation, and you end it not loving Jesus more, but more afraid of the world. I saw one recently, I don't even know who it was, but it was a pastor who preached in front of a very large congregation, and he spent 20 minutes of his sermon, 20 minutes talking about the Chinese spy balloon. I was interested. I want to hear what he had to say. 20 minutes of the Chinese spy balloon and all the geopolitical ramifications of it. Now, as I watched that, I said, well, is what is he saying true? Well, I don't know. I don't claim to be an expert on these things. But what I do know is instead of preaching the gospel, he spent 20 minutes of a TED Talk. And the saddest part is that that congregation left more afraid of China than they did in love with Jesus. Romans 1.16 says that is dangerous. Why? Because it is not the geopolitical things of this world that will save us. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the power of God unto salvation. So the question, church, is what are we to do in response? How are we to then steward the gospel? Well, I think there's two things. Number one, Paul shows what the response of me as the pastor of the church should do. Notice, Paul says it is Timothy's responsibility to charge them not to teach a certain way. And this idea of charge is actually, in the Greek, more of a military command, meaning that Timothy had the authority, the responsibility, and even the obligation to guard the teaching in the church. The church's primary ministry will always be the proclamation of the Word of God. Therefore, as a pastor, it is my responsibility not just to guard how I teach, but to guard all of the teaching in the local church. One day, I believe according to the Word of God, I will stand before God and give an account for my teaching, but also for everything that is taught here in our church. Therefore, I have to be very careful who I allow speaks from this pulpit. That's why we don't have a lot of others that come and speak. And when those that do speak, I believe they are preaching faithfully the Word of God. That's why, therefore, I have to, with the help of others, be careful who teaches and leads our small groups and different Bible studies in our church. That's why we have to be careful who wants to lead and serve on different committees and teams. Why? Because they are stewards of the gospel. Simply put, just because somebody wants to teach or lead, or be on a position in the local church does not mean they automatically have the right to do so. We have the responsibility, not just me, but secondly, you, to be stewards of the gospel. You say, well, pastor, what is the responsibility of the church? I believe it's this. To create and cultivate a culture that loves the Word of God. How? Number one, by loving the Word of God ourselves. Two, by keeping different teachers accountable. That means as you sit in teaching and preaching, whether it's in Sunday school or small groups or even me, myself included, that you are filtering everything that you hear based not on opinion, but based on the Word of God. Not because you are wanting to just prove them wrong. It's not that, well, okay, pastor finally made that mistake. Now I get to call him on it. No, it's not that. It's because I love the Word of God. And that if a teacher or a preacher or a pastor says something that is outside of the truth, that we would lovingly and kindly call them on that fact. You see, in my opinion, one of the most dangerous things that happens in the life of the church is when you go to a Bible study or you go to a teaching time and they ask that question. So I want to read a passage of Scripture and they ask that question. Well, what does this mean to you. In my opinion, that is one of the most dangerous things that happens in the life of the church, because then what happens is we go in a circle and everyone says, well, I think it means this, or I think it means that, or I believe this about it. I'll never forget when I was uh, the youth pastor at my previous church, and one time in a Sunday school class, we had a guy, he was a young guy, he was probably, I think, teaching his very first lesson in the church, and he was so nervous. He got up there and he started fumbling through the the Scripture. He would read a passage of Scripture and then he would ask that question. Well, what does this mean to you? Well, people would say a few things and he'd kind of go into that next verse. What does that mean? What, What are you getting out of that? Until finally, one of the older men in the class lovingly raised his hand and said, Son, I don't care what it means to me. Tell me what it says. See, church, that's what we need. 
We need people that don't care what others think. We need people that care what does the Word of God say. Because that is what will give new life. That is what will transform us. You see, Ephesus, I believe, didn't oppose God's Word. But the danger is is that they did not think God's Word was enough. They wanted to go deeper. They wanted greater revelation. They wanted a greater thrill than just the truths that were found in the Word of God. Let me ask you, have you fallen out of love with God's Word? Is there a love? Is there a hunger? Is there a desire for the Word of God in your life? Because it is only a church that loves the Word of God and stands on the Word of God in a loving way that will ultimately transform others for the gospel of Jesus. Do we love the Word? And then secondly, finally, you'll see on the screen is the truth of we are called to love others with the truth. Notice verse 5. You would think Paul would say, Our aim is to stand on the truth. That's not what he says. He says the aim of our charge is love. It's love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. It is our aim is love. Paul says that we are to contend for the truth, but do it in love. Number one, to even love that person who is not stewarding the truth well. Even false teachers, I believe, are not our enemies. We see someone that is outside the truth. We recognize that they are someone who is a sinner just like we are and ultimately needs Christ. So our goal in this is to not win a debate. It is to win our brothers with the truth of the gospel. But secondly, we are to love the church. In Titus 1.11, Paul says that false teachers were in that church as well. And he says they must be silenced. Why? Because they are upsetting entire families. You see, sometimes we use this idea of love as an excuse not to contend for the truth. But what I have learned is that that produces a peace, but it's a false peace. It is not a genuine, life-giving peace. Peace. If wolves are allowed to continue to have a say in the local body of the church, therefore the sheep will suffer. We cannot say that we really love the bride of Christ and then allow anything that anybody wants to teach happen in the life of the church. Because notice, if we allow the truth to go forward, notice the result. Notice what Paul says. He, look at these things. He says that our aim is a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So if the truth is not going forward, then these things are not happening. A pure heart. When we experience the love of Christ, we are made new. We are forgiven. We are made right before God. A good conscience. That, yes, means that we are removed of our shame and our guilt before God, but at the same time in this culture, the idea of a good conscience wasn't just between you and your relationship with God, it was you and your relationship with others. That changes things, doesn't it? You see, some of you right now are battling with shame and guilt. Why? Because there are broken relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul says the gospel creates a good conscience. It creates peace and unity within church and ultimately a sincere faith. That is someone that has been completely made new by the blood of Jesus Christ and stands right before God. He says, certain persons though in verse 6, by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. You see, if love was the aim, they swerved around it like an obstacle in the road. They were few in number, but make no mistake, their influence was wide. Paul says it is because ultimately they forgot the most important thing. Love. They wanted to be teachers of the law, he says. Why? Ultimately, not because of the love of the Word of God or the love for others. No, they wanted to be teachers of the law. Why? Because of the praise and the recognition that they received. They wanted people to listen to them and have influence. Ultimately, their desire wasn't to be faithful to the Word of God. Their desire was to have power, influence in the church. Newt Larson says it this way. 
He says their inner spirits became muddied by sin and wrong thinking. Their behavior was ineffective and at odds within the church. Their reputations were built on controversy and not love. Let me ask you something, church. What are you known for? Not everybody's called to teach and preach, and that's okay, but we all have influence. They were known for controversy. What's your reputation? Are you known as someone who loves others, cares well, builds people up, or as a peacemaker? Or are you known as someone who quarrels, who complains, who discourages others, who brings people Down, You see, many churches are out there that believe the gospel and want to stand on the truth, but because of division, because of gossip, because of fighting, the gospel is not rejected, but the gospel is ignored. Ask yourself, does the words that I use, does it promote the gospel or does it distract from it? Paul reminds us, it's a sobering thought, that it would just take a few people who forget love and instead grow bitter and angry and focus only on themselves that ultimately can tear the church apart. He says, notice, they wandered away into vain discussion. Now, this idea of wandered away is actually somewhat of a medical term. It was a medical term almost for some part of the body being out of place or something being dislocated. Now, I've never had the joy of having something dislocated. But at the same time, I know that when that happens, number one, the entire body is impacted because there's pain involved. But secondly, I also know that that part of the body is then rendered ineffective. Essentially, what Paul was saying is that because of false teaching and a lack of love in the church, there are parts of the body that have been dislocated. There are parts of the body of Christ that are now hindered from the ministry that they are to be about, and the entire church is suffering as a result. The question I have to ask as we finish this morning, church, is this. Not just how do you want to be known, what are you known for? But the question is, is what are we going to be known for? What is our reputation going to be to those in the community that know who we are and what we are to be about? Last week, we saw in the first two verses, and we talked about at length, that you have this very imperfect church that is Ephesus, led by this very imperfect pastor that is Timothy. But even through that, God uses their weakness and their faithfulness in order to share the gospel. As I was leaving last week, a lady stopped me in the lobby and she said something that I will never forget. She said, Pastor, as I heard you preach, she said, I agree with you completely. We also, we are not a perfect church. But she said something I'll never forget. She says, we are not a perfect church, but we're a loving church. And I stopped and I thought and I said, you know what? I agree with that statement completely. We're not a perfect church. We never will be. But I believe we are a loving church. There's so much that we can improve on and work on and that we continue to fight for. But at the same time, I believe we are a church that as a whole loves and loves well. Why is that so important? Well, because the Bible says that love covers a multitude of wrongs. You see, when bitterness and anger sets in and creeps into our heart, we can find something wrong with anything and everything that we see. However, if we love the gospel and love the church and love one another, we are willing then to overlook imperfections. We are willing to forgive others. We are willing at times to not have things done our way. Why? Because ultimately our way is not important. It's God's way. It is ultimately what will the gospel thrive? How will the gospel thrive? What will allow the gospel of Jesus Christ to go forward? So, Church, what do we want to be known for? There's a lot of churches known for a lot of things. Some churches are known for their facilities, some for their music, some for their preaching, others for their programs. All of those things in and of themselves are well and good. But I want you to know I'm proud to be a part of a church known for its love. Why? Because Jesus himself said, this is how the world will know that you are my disciples. 
but you love one another. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your Word this morning. And God, I pray that we would be convicted based on Your Word to to love You, to love the Word, and to love truth. God, I pray that we would love others with the truth because ultimately it is the truth that will set them free. God, we thank You that You have allowed us to be stewards of the Gospel. But Lord, we do not stand with pride as though we have some superior truth within us, but God, we humbly then want to stand on that truth. To love others. To share the love of Jesus that they might be made new as well. God, I pray for that person in this room. Lord, I imagine there is someone under the sound of my voice that does not know You. Maybe they've come to church. Maybe they are open to the things of God, but they have never truly surrendered to You the truth, the way, and the life. God, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. God, I pray for that person perhaps in this room that stands on the truth, but have done so not with love. Lord, I pray that we would be known as a church that stands both on love and truth. Hand in hand, Lord, that others might be changed. God, we love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in just a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to sing our song of response. It's simply a time for you to ask God, how do you need to respond to your word? That's something that's ultimately between you and God. Whether that needs to happen in the pew after church, if you want to come and pray with Pastor Adam or myself, we'll be down front as well. But whatever the case is, please do not leave here today without walking in obedience. Would you stand and would you sing? Amen. Just want to say thanks again for coming and worshiping with us this morning. Just a reminder tonight at 530, I think you'll see on the screen, there's the topic for our adult equipped to engage. Tonight we're going to ask the question, people say, I want to share the gospel, but how do I take a normal conversation and steer it into a spiritual conversation? So I hope you come out and will be a part of that. Remember, we also have children and youth activities going on at the very same time. We'd love to have you and your whole family come back tonight. But as always, we've now gathered as the church. Let's go and be the church. Have a blessed day.